That's why I like talking to Frank at 3.30. And uh, he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline, the Phillies mailbag. Your questions every Tuesday at this time, plus an injury. And we'll start with that. Frank Close, 97.3 ESPN.com. Reliever David Robertson on the injured list. And how does that affect a Phillies bullpen, Frank, that has been maligned and has been used and abused? I mean, a 14-inning game on Sunday, 11 innings last night. I mean, this injury for one of the more durable pitchers, I saw Jason Stark tweet that out the other day, comes in at an ill-advised time. Yeah, you know, David Robertson had never been on the disabled list when he signed with the Phillies. This is his first injury list appearance of his entire career. That's one of the reasons the Phillies got him is he was a durable arm. You know, the other names they were considering uh, might have had some track records of of injury, and, and he seemed like the safer bet, perhaps, which is why the Phillies went down that road. But, you know, you mentioned those uh, extra inning games. I kind of wonder, personally, if if they don't try to ride this out, if they didn't have that really long, for, well, the first game, <laughs> the first game that goes 14 innings, uh, you really needed a fresh arm. I, I know Ricky Batalico after the game was saying, well, you know, you really got to find a way to get a fresh arm in here. So maybe the Phillies just decided to, to go on the side of caution with Robertson and, and bring up Drew Anderson, who had a really great spring for them, just to, to try to give them what, what Gabe Kapler said, length. You know, he said when, uh, you know, when he was asked how Drew Anderson would be used, he said, look, he's a guy who can actually give us some length. And that was something that they needed. And, you know, they're, they're kind of behind the eight ball again. Hopefully there's not another extra inning game today. Yeah, the uh, extra inning games have been – uh, really taxing on this bullpen in the early stages of the season. So uh, how do you think they cope with that closing spot if uh, they need to go to a guy? Is it Sir Anthony or is it continuing to be, hey, let's go Sir Anthony, Nishak, and kind of a committee approach? Well, I tend to think just what I've seen the last few days, they're, they're kind of leaning on Pat Nishak as the veteran arm to get the last few outs. You know, the fact that he, he came into the game uh, rather late uh, last night was kind of an indication that maybe they were trying to save him to, to be the closer if, 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 if uh, they need to or kind of kind of get the last few outs. I mean, of course, the Phillies would have won at the bottom of the inning no matter who pitched the inning before. But uh, I, I think that they, they've been leaning on him really to do that. And, um, you know, certainly with, with uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez not really – giving them what they thought he would and, and perhaps having his velocity down a tick and being pushed further back into the bullpen. Uh, you know, David Robertson was supposed to be the, the backup plan for him. And so it kind of hurts, hurts to have both of them out. So, But I think they're going to lean Nishak when they can and um, just see where things go. And there really hasn't been an update on Tommy Hunter anytime recently either. So you can't even consider him coming back soon. Yeah, Hunter would be a big help for this bullpen if they can get him back, but that's not going to be – uh, at least for a little while longer. Let's jump into the mailbag questions this week from our listeners. Don wants to know, is there a better option than Knapp as a backup catcher? My only recollection of Knapp was him hitting that walk-off homer last year. So I'm like, why does everybody hate Knapp so much? No, he has been uh, pretty tough to watch so far. But uh, any options for Andrew Knapp as the backup? Well, it's pretty interesting because I kind of started writing this up until this afternoon just kind of saying, okay, come on, it's a backup catcher. What are you going to do? There's no real options out there. Uh, you know, Andrew Knapp, I mean, most of the time Andrew Knapp's been batting this season. He's been coming in against the closer because he's the, the last guy off the bench. Uh, so so I, I kind of give him a little leeway in that regard. But then something interesting happened today, and that is the Boston Red Sox designated for assignment the contract of Blake Swihart. And Phillies fans might know that name a little bit because back in 2015, when we were talking about where Cole Hamels might be traded, Blake Swihart was kind of the top prospect that the Red Sox might surrender in a trade. And in fact, some some writers, in fact, I even linked to one in the mailbag at, at one of the, the, the Boston radio stations called, called Blake Swihart an untouchable prospect. You know, he's a switch hitting catcher, uh, hasn't really hit a lot in the major leagues, uh, and, and has kind of not connected with the, the Boston Red Sox pitchers so far this year. Uh, but this is a guy drafted in the first round, has a lot of talent. And because he was designated for assignment, he's going to go through the waiver process. And, and I think the Phillies might, not necessarily because it's a, a, a dire need to, to fill a backup catcher, uh, but I think it w wouldn't hurt to put a waiver claim on Blake Swihart and see if you can get him. Um, 
one, he's the only guy available, and it seems like a good opportunity to see if a change of scenery could help somebody like him. I mean, like Nath, he's a switch hitter, and he might be able to get some left-handed bats behind the plate. And, and you never know. Maybe maybe the Phillies catching uh, uh, coaches and Bob Stumpo and Craig Driver can do something to, to sort of bring him along a little bit. Uh, and, and one nice thing is Andrew Nath still has a minor league option. So I'd be really interested to see how this plays out and – you know, the Phillies have a better record than a lot of teams that might want to claim Blake Swihart. So usually the, the waiver claim goes to the t- team who has the worst record. It might not be the Phillies, but uh, that could could be an option. But other than that, I think the, the Phillies just kind of ride this out a little bit. And, you know, maybe they do get another catcher at at, 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 at some point throughout the season. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Rich wants to know, what do you think of Kimbrell at three years for $50 million? Is yeah, that a possibility? Kimbrell is that that's that's pretty interesting. Is you know the the situation that a lot of teams find themselves right now. Uh, you know, in terms of in terms of contract, three years and fifty million dollars is terrible. You know, and it kind of puts them in the the range where somebody like Wake Davis got from the Chicago Cubs, and it doesn't seem unreasonable. Now it's way less than he initially was said to have been asking for, which was a hundred million dollars over six seasons. What's going to happen if you offer that kind of money to to, to Craig Kimbrell right now is it kind of gets in, involved with the competitive balance tax, tax threshold. Now, the way that that's all set up, that a team is charged not for what a player is making in any given season, but on the average annual value of the deal. Now, the Phillies only have about $18 million left under the competitive balance tax. So if the Phillies assigned Craig Kimbrell to a deal like that, which is just under $17 million a year, it's going to put them right up against that that threshold and it's going to really inhibit their ability to do something else, like maybe sign a starting pitcher or maybe the backup catcher, if that's what they so choose to do. Uh, but but really, the, that's kind of handcuffing a lot of teams because if the player doesn't want to, to to take a smaller salary for one year and try again later, teams are going to be bound by the average annual value of the whole deal. And you can't like what they used to do, you know, maybe – Maybe sign him to $5 million for, for this year, but then bump up to 20. You can't even do that because, you know, 5 plus 20 it will be half of $25 million and be 12.5. So I think a lot of teams have their budget set, which is why teams aren't really able to go that high right now. So, so while in itself that deal might not be terrible, I think when you're looking at the greater picture, you're going to see that, that it's kind of hard to fit in under that competitive uh, balance tax and I think for a team like the Phillies, who hopes to be better down the line still and wants to do a few more things in subsequent seasons, it might be really hard to go over that level right now and incur some penalties going forward. I rock Philly on Twitter. So he's curious about the Phillies' chances of getting uh, Madison Bumgarner. The Giants are uh, expected to be in rebuild mode. Is there any uh, realistic possibility of, of that happening? You know, I liken this San Francisco Giants team to the 2014 Phillies. You know, the 2014 Phillies, they had some aging veterans, uh, not a whole lot left in the tank, but they, but some of them do have some something left in the tank. Uh, their farm system is, is pretty weak at the moment. And so, so basically the Giants need to have a rebuild, and the reason why they snagged Farhan Zaidi from the Los Angeles Dodgers was they were looking for a new architect for a new rebuild. So if you go through if you go through the uh, the Giants roster, Madison Bumgarner is the piece that they could probably convert for prospects. Why? He's only making twelve million dollars this year, and for teams that are worried about that competitive balance tax, that's a very attractive contract to take because it's not big enough that it's going to interfere for a team like the Phillies who might have uh, have eighteen million dollars worth. So so the Phillies will be hit for a prorated portion of twelve million dollars. And that will leave some other money to do some other things. So uh, John Morosi of MLB.com reported the other day that the Phillies had done their due diligence on Madison Bumgarner, perhaps prompting um, his question. And, and really, of course, the Phillies are going to check in because he makes a lot of sense. He's a left-handed starter. The Phillies are getting inconsistent, inconsistent starting pitching. And, I mean, even when you get it from your ace, Aaron Nola, then it just really puts the spotlight even more on the other guys like Nick Pavetta and Zach Eflin and Vince Velasquez who have their good days and who have their bad days. So, so I think the Phillies will definitely be listening when, 
when Bumgarner or any other starter is a uh, possibility, but for for a team like the Giants to maximize their value, they might wait all the way until closer to the trade deadline where uh, teams are bidding against each other in terms of prospects, and we'll see where that goes. So there's still still some time for this to play out, but I think the Phillies are, are definitely keeping an ear to the ground to see what might work out, and, and you know, you never know what they'll do. I mean, the JT Real Muto uh, trade, that, that, was, that was the trade every other team was trying to make. And, and we, you know, the Phillies kept, kept, kept their ears open. And what do you know, they got it done. So, so I think he will be among uh, – Bumgarner will be among the players the Phillies are looking at as you get, get towards the trade deadline and the Phillies are trying to get better. All right. Uh, every uh, Tuesday, Frank Close answers your questions. Send them to Frank on Twitter, at Frank Close with a K. And, uh, right, uh, by the way, Reese Hoskins out tonight with a sore ankle, not in the Phillies lineup. Jared Eikhoff has been uh, recalled uh, for the Phillies as well. So a couple of uh, moves by the Phillies before their Game 2 series matchup with the Metropolitans. Frank, thanks, pal. Thanks, guys.